behalf of Brockton Interfaith Community, the Cape Verdean Association, and the Haitian Community Partners, we welcome you to this uh, candidates forum for the Plymouth County 10th District seat. My name is John Seville. I am a leader with Brockton Interfaith Community. I will refer to that as BIC for the rest of the evening. Uh, I worship at St. Patrick's Church and uh, I will be acting as the chair this evening. Um, I've been a Brocktonian for 26 years, so obviously I wasn't born here, but I, uh, I like Brockton. Okay, these youngsters here joining me up here will be acting as co-facilitators. We have from the Cape Verdean Association and St. Edith Stein Parish, Miss Monica Tavares, and from the Haitian Community Partners, we have uh, Adeus Pierre. You may have attended a uh, gubernatorial forum earlier in the summer that the HCP put on, and it was very successful. Okay, a little bit about BIC. Um, we do not endorse any political candidate or we are comprised of a diverse peoples from different religious backgrounds, and we work to foster positive change. We try to make Brockton a better place to live. And uh, I'll mention, I'll bring up two things that we've done recently. One is, was on a state level, and the other was on a more local, local level. We, uh, we worked with sister organizations over the past year, collected way more signatures than we needed to get earned sick time and an increase in minimum wage on the ballot. Well, the legislators uh, moved quickly and passed the minimum wage, a pretty good bill. Uh, we, no we now have the highest minimum wage <clears throat> in the country. So, uh, and the paid earned sick time will be on uh, the November ballot. And we, we are going to be out working during the fall, trying to get all those people who uh, haven't been voting and try to tell them about pay during sick time and why it's important. And uh, the other thing, on a local level, we've had uh, some very strong leaders working on the public safety campaign over the years. And they have, uh, they were able to move 26 of the local community leaders to write letters of support. Some of them are here right now. And they, they have managed to get, secure the funding to bring a, a drug court here to Brockton. And, uh, and, you know, they've been working tirelessly on prevention versus prosecution. And I think this will be good for not only the people that have the issues, but I think, I think it'll bring some jobs here too as well, some professional people here to Brockton. So that's a win-win. Those are just two examples, and Vic needs a lot of help, so please keep us in mind. Now, Monica is going to give a brief uh, summary of the CVA, what they do. Thank you, John. My name is Monica Tavares, and I'm a parishioner here at the St. Eden Stein Parish, and a program manager at the Cape Verde Association. Uh, the association was established in 1977 with the purpose to best serve and represent the interests of the Caverian community. We provide different social services from after school to summer programs to family civilization initiatives. We are here because we care and we want to let someone who will best represent our interests and advocate for our needs. Thank you and I'll pass the word to my colleague, Pierre. Good evening. My name is Adius Pierre, and I'm the Vice President for Haitian Community Partners. It's a pleasure for me to be here tonight. Haitian Community Partners were created last year by a group of professional and Haitian American residing in Boacton. In HCP, we promote education, youth leadership, advocacy, job search, and so 
I'm very pleased to be with you tonight, and I have my president, Marvin Amede, is there, and, <laughs> and, and our advisor, senior advisor, uh, Joseph Francois. Thank you for having me, and I will be one of the moderators. Thank you. The reason we put this together, um, all our organizations have been uh, civically involved recently, and uh, you know we're all here tonight for the same reason because we care. You know the candidates care; they wouldn't be sacrificing all this time trying to get a state rep seat. Uh, you care because you know you want to know who's going to represent your special interests, and that the re a lot of people uh, they don't vote. And then they, they wonder, you know, why no one's sticking up for them. So uh, I, think, I think these forums are very important. And uh, hopefully it'll help you with your decision making tonight. So, uh, and also we want to stress that every vote counts. Uh, last year's election was decided by 67 votes for the mayor, the mayor of Brockton. It's just 67 votes. So uh, if you don't think your vote counts, <laughs> it, it, you're, you're wrong. And uh, vote, vote often. Ideas? Okay, so tonight, we hope to become informed about our Republican and Democratic candidate for the state representative seat being vacant by Representative Christine Canavan, whom we thank for her 22 years of public service. <laughs> now, I would like to ask Ms. Uh, Monica to join me on the podium. All right, so we're gonna welcome our candidates. I'm just gonna ask you guys to hold your applause until the end, until we introduce every candidate. So to my left, I have Democrat Paul Beckner, Peggy Curtis, and Councilor Michelle Dubois, and Republican Colleen Maloney. Uh, Republican candidate Paul Cruz could not be here with us today. So let's welcome the candidates then. As a faith-based organization, we always begin our events with a word of prayer. This, this evening, we are privileged to have the Tri-Parish Pastor Joe Rake here, and he is going to welcome us in and open us up with a word of prayer. Once again, good evening, everyone. Let us begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather here this night because we are people who believe in today and the many blessings that you give to us today, but we also people who believe in tomorrow and believe that tomorrow can be better if we use the gifts and talents that you have given to us to make tomorrow better for ourselves and for our community. We ask that you bless us as we gather here this night. Bless us with attentive ears so that we can truly hear what our candidates present to us. Bless our hearts so that we may truly work together for the good of this community, for the city of Brockton, and for every individual who lives in this community. Help us this night to grow in an understanding of what truly is at stake each and every day and the need that we all have to care for our sisters and brothers, to make wise decisions, to select the best candidate, to do what is right for the good of those entrusted to our care, our family members, our friends, especially those who are most vulnerable. So bless us this night, bless those candidates who are here with us and what they will share, and bless all of us with open hearts to hear their story, their beliefs, and to ultimately make the right decisions. So bless us this night in what we do together. We ask this through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Thank you, Father. I would like to review our skipping and ground rules with you tonight. We ask that cell phone to be either turned off or put in silent mode. However, if you want to take a phone call, please take it outside. In case of an emergency, exit are located left and right. The bathrooms are on your left. Tonight's agenda, five questions were created from conversations with city residents like you. These will be the only questions asked you on the form. We have a timekeeper. It's right here in the front. Mr. Great Krikorian. Here, along with Monica and I, we'll see that we all get home early to get some rest. <laughs> Candidate, please respect the timekeeper. And you, the audience, please remain quiet until closing statement are complete. Understood? Thank you. We also have a yellow card. You can fill it out, and when you leave in, you can drop it at the table to your left. Now, I'm going to ask Miss Monica to come back. Okay, so let's get started. So before we start, let me just review the format. So each candidate will be asked to respond five questions, have a minute and a half to respond to each question. Then we'll rotate between questions responding first. We have a timekeeper, which is right here, he's right here. We'll help inform our candidates of time remaining in response time. And with a minute, a minute I mean, I'm sorry, with a minute closing statement at the end. And I want to remind that this is not a debate, so you might not respond out of your given time. Okay? All right, so here comes the first question. Uh, earned sick time. Approximately one million workers across Massachusetts do not have the benefit of earned sick time. Recovering from an illness or staying home to care for a child is not an option. Question four on general ballot would allow up to five days is it me? Was it me? Of earned sick time. So my question is, if chosen a primary, will you commit to making this initiative a priority for your campaign, including door knocking and public speaking events? And my question goes to candidate Paul Beckner. I'd first like to say thank you to uh, Brockton and the Faith Community and the BCA for filming this and uh, hosting this forum. And thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. I think it's very important. Uh, to answer that first question, up to five days, well, absolutely, no question about it. In fact, I would, I would support something where you would actually accrue a day for each month that you're at work. That might give you 12 a year. I don't think that's too much to ask. Um, there are two ways that employers approach their business today. And one is to treat the employee with respect, provide good wages and a good work environment, make them feel needed. In this scenario, monetary growth is a little slower, but the ultimate rewards are security and stability, because your employees will be loyal. Number two, the second scenario, is to treat employees as a number, which a great majority of businesses and corporations do out there today. This leads to higher profits initially, and more immediately, and the revolving door begins with help from the employee at will doctrine, which in this state says that an employee can be let go for any reason, no reason at all, or a reason that they want to fabricate. It is not a stinking thing that can be done according to the law in the state of Massachusetts. I want to see that amended so that more employees have to foster an, an environment, like I gave an example number one. Thank you. Thank you, Beckner. Candidate Curtis. 
would again like to say thank you for uh, hosting this event this evening. Um, some of you have already known me because I'm a member of BIC, and I've also um, been out there gathering signatures for the sick time. I think it's extremely important that uh, employer employees have the benefit of earning up to five <laughs> sick days in a year in order to maybe take care of a sick child, go to the dentist, um, take care of an elderly um, parent. Um, as we get older, our parents get older, and we need to take that time, and we shouldn't be punished for um, taking time off to take care of a sick child. And we also shouldn't have our employees in fear of their jobs. Um, we all know that a sick child goes to um, school sick, infects other children, infects the teachers, and can start an epidemic. So yes, I'm totally in favor of the um, Earn Sick Time Bill, which is also um, on the public ballot for up to 11 employees and up to five sick days. So yes, I'm totally in support of it. Thank you, candidate Curtis. Council Dubai. Thank you. Um, I really am very happy to be with all of you here tonight. I'm not exactly sure what's happening with the mic, so I apologize. Um, I am in support of Earn Sick Time. I have already been, been um, talking about it when I knock on doors in the district. I, I enjoy, I, as a city councilor for the last nine years, I've really fought for working families and to make life easier for the people that I represent in local city government. And as a state representative, I want to bring that type of service, that type of working families representation to the state house. This earned sick time legislation really is at the heart of what is important to working families. So I've already been working for it. I've already been using persuasion to get uh, the folks that I meet when I'm walking and meeting people at their doors and their homes and out in the community to support Earn Sick Time. I really am focused on getting everyone to understand that when we help a parent stay home to take care of their sick child, that we're helping the whole community become a better place. Because too often parents lose jobs just because they're being a good parent. And as a city councilor, I've focused on respecting the rights of parents to be the good parent that they want to be. And Earn Sick Time is definitely a part of that. So thank you all for letting me be here tonight. I'm enjoying my time with you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilor DeBar. Candidate Maloney. I want to thank you guys for having me as well um, and for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Colleen Maloney. So this is a ballot question. I, I like the idea of putting it to the ballot and letting you know the voters of Massachusetts have their say in how they ultimately feel whether feel about this issue. Um, unfortunately, I think it's going to it somewhat paints all businesses with a broad brush in that rest, you know the restaurant business, for example, you have the ability to switch shifts and work around that. And I think with this with this legislation, it's going to not lead to job increase, but it's going to lead to layoffs, especially among small businesses and as well as, um, like I mentioned, things like the restaurant industry and customer service industry. So I think there needs to be some solution, but I, this bill, unfortunately, I don't think is the answer. Um, I do respect though, the fact that it is on the ballot. I signed on to help get, I've signed myself on to say it should be on the ballot, but ultimately, you know, I wouldn't, if it passes, I wouldn't fight to repeal it, but I think, I don't think it's the correct answer for what is trying to be obtained. Thank you, candidate Malone. Here come the questions. If elected, will you took, I'm sorry, will, will you take leadership on the station to mandate health insurance coverage for 90 days plus? And how will make this happen? I'm gonna start with Peggy Curtis, please. Thank you very much. Um, this question is very near and dear to me. As many of you know, I have been personally affected by the drug epidemic. And in the 14 years that it took me to get my son sober, I hit many roadblocks to getting him sober, and one of them was insurance and detox. So I absolutely will take leadership on this. I think 
the rule of thumb is the number of um, days in treatment equals the number of days in sobriety. So this treatment will save the cost uh, of the, the cost to taxpayers if we put people who are involved in drugs in treatment versus jail. We will save lots of money. We'll save a jail bed, which costs up to forty-eight thousand dollars. Treatment is up to fourteen thousand dollars. Immediately, the savings is very evident. And also, too, with the drug board in Brockton, we just secured funding for that. So I'm really proud to be part of that team that helped bring that um, drug board to Brockton. This is proven across the nation and other states that recidivism is reduced by 70% the first year that a drug court is established. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good one. Thank you, Andrew. Um, the, the prevention, not persecute, not um, not incarceration. I think that is a that is an ex exact excellent way to, to put this issue. I too, like many of you in this room, have had personal experience with a loved one with uh, substance abuse addiction. Um, my brother had substance abuse addiction, and unfortunately, um, his addiction came at a time in the 80s when people with addiction, it wasn't treated like an illness. And he was more or less um, thrown on the street, wound up getting AIDS, and passed away. So that is why, as a city councilor, I really fought for um, corrective measures. And that's why when John mentioned that 20 leaders in the community wrote letters of support to bring the drug court to, to, to Brockton, I was one of those 20 leaders um, that wrote a letter of support to bring the drug court to Brockton. I also met with Congressman Lynch, and when we talked, he had just appropriated $12 million to come to Massachusetts to expand drug courts. And I asked him to bring his powers to bear at the court level to bring a drug court to Brockton. And he agreed, as most of us in this room agree, that it's important not only for the individual and the family to keep that person out of prison, working and supporting their children, but it's also important for our financial system in the state. Because like um, one of my fellow candidates has already said, it costs $48,000 to keep someone in prison. And we could have that person be an active part of our society. Thank you. Thank you. Can I um, I absolutely agree with the 90-day uh, mandatory uh, coverage. How we would pay for, I mean, everyone has dealt with drug addiction that doesn't know you know, class or race or anything. So how we could afford to, the second part of the question is how we could afford to, to pay for it. I think healthcare costs are 40% of Massachusetts budgets. There's plenty of ways, if we can create more individualized plans, there are plenty of ways that we can make this happen. It's totally attainable and it's a fiscally responsible move to make because as mentioned, you know, getting nonviolent offenders into treatment reduces their recidivism and it helps the community as a whole. Um, just to quickly touch upon ways we can make it happen. The Healthcare Connector website, we had arguably the worst rollout once um, we had to switch over to federal regulations. So if we can look at some of the issues there and start, you know, really have a more transparent and accountable government, we can start seeing the money, we can start allocating those funds towards legislation such as this. Thank you. Uh, Paul? I think the, uh, the treatment should be extended for whatever time it's needed. I had a family member who was in treatment 16 different times. He went all over the East Coast. And they were mostly 15, 30 day treatment centers. And me and my sister lost their home in Middlebar as a result. They lost almost every penny they had. Had to move in my parents' house on Brookfield Drive. But I'm happy to say he fought and fought and fought. And with, with uh, the patients of my, my my loving sister, that's for sure. And uh, but not many people were that patient. Uh, and he's now a counselor. He earned a certificate. He counsels uh, young adults and, uh, and older who have had their own fits with uh, substance abuse or with the alcohol and drugs. Uh, there's really no other solution besides education and treatment. Healthcare itself has become a gigantic drain on citizens. I witnessed this article from Joshua Archibald, director of Healthcare Policy at the Pioneer Institute. 
Health care costs every man, woman, and child in the Bay State on an average a whopping $7,550 per year, according to a landmark report that was uh, that also found state residents receiving taxpayer funded care account of 60% uh, of the $50.5 million total cost. So for the money we pay for health care, it's a disgrace not to extend coverage to 90 days for those who need it. I'll be working on Beacon Hill by studying ways to reduce health care costs for all while extending this coverage. Thank you. Thank you. Immigration. As you all know, America is a country of immigrants, so they say you're Brockton and myself. As you enter this race to represent Brockton with so many immigrant groups who could benefit from legislation such as in-state tuition, the safe driving bill as the repeal of the Secure Communities program, program. My question is, do you support the safe driving bill, which would make all people safe on the road, and if elected, what will you do to make sure it gets passed? And the question goes to Councilor Dubois. Thank you very much. Uh, if I'm honored enough to get your vote and be elected your state representative, I will support um, the safe driving bill. And I will do that for multiple reasons after, after thinking long and hard about it. First off, I support working families. And so, like so many in this, in this city, many people have to drive to work. So if they're going to drive to work because everybody knows your first priority is taking care of your child and you have to work, they are going to go to work and they are going to get there any way they can. So having them know the rules of the, of the road, know how to operate a vehicle, have insurance so if there is an accident, everyone in the car and everyone in the other car is covered are essential and critical for a working family's agenda. But it goes a little bit further. As a city councilor, I learned that you can't be in control of everything because so many things are state and federal uh, decisions. And as a state representative, the same will hold true. If we, I can't take control over federal immigration policy, but what I can do is make sure that everyone in Massachusetts, um, we know where immigrants, undocumented individuals are. And a license, having that license in your hand means if there's a rape, if there's a murder, if there's a robbery, the police have an address of record. So not only is it a working family's agenda, it's a public safety agenda. And I think it really moves the envelope forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Dubois. I'm not too sure about the word, I don't know if I messed it up. I think right now it should be Ken Maloney. Okay. Yep. Um, I understand the concerns of all the aspiring Americans in the community, um, and I understand why the legislation was presented, but I just think that ultimately we need to start taking care of, you know, we have, I agree with the idea of um, in-state tuition for the uh, children of immigrants, but as far as the driving, uh, the driving licenses, I would have to disagree. Um, I just think that there is an amicable solution and I think we should be focusing on the road towards citizenship rather than these other, you know, this other legislation that just going to do that. Thank you, Ken. Hello. Ken, did back me? Well, I support anything that can ensure safer driving conditions for all. Driving a car shouldn't be viewed as an evil necessity. Um, the safe driving law does uh, make it a to be texting as you're driving. I think we all know the dangers of that. And if you're 75 years or older, uh, you've got to re take the test, which is good. I think uh, yeah, you get to that point. I'm not sure how you judge it, but I know some people who are 75 that are very sharp and still drive great. But I mean, it's not a bad place to start. Um, when you're under 18, you can't use a phone when you're driving under any conditions. I think that's very smart, and I think that's uh, it's, it's, it's necessary. No question about that. Uh, three offenses in two years. Now that's something, it all depends on the offenses. I, uh, three offenses, three driving offenses in two years. It seems like a bit much to need to go to safe driving school. But after serious offenses, yes, I can see that necessity. So that's something I'd have to uh, re-examine. Uh, as for uh, immigrants here illegally and undocumented, if they're not going to be deported, then let's give them documentation and a license to drive. 
It'll make our streets safer. It's going to help them move along in society. I think that's a smart way to go. As far as criminals, we have to deport them, yes. But if they're going to be here, then let's quit playing games. Let's document them and let's get them licenses and make them an integral part of our society. That's only right. This is the United States of America. That's the way we should behave on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, candidate back now. Candidate Curtis. Thank you. Um, I'm all for safe driving and uh, more safety on the road. And you know, when you're driving around Brockton, you can tell um, the newer drivers they're more cautious. And I believe that anyone who wants to drive a car should absolutely take a driving course. But I'm concerned with the way the bill is written right now. A Massachusetts license right now is used to prove who you are. It's used to enter federal buildings and board a plane. And right now, as it stands, Massachusetts is one of nine states that is not in compliance with real ID. So right now, as a Massachusetts resident, you cannot enter certain federal buildings with your Massachusetts license because it does not have proof of citizenship. My concern with issuing uh, licenses, mass licenses, to undocumented citizens is that how do they prove who they are and where they're from? I'm concerned about the safety of all residents and I'm also concerned about the cost because as it stands now as a Massachusetts resident, if your license is not authenticated or um, able to prove who you are, it's going to cost you more money to get more I Thank you, Candidate Curtis. Like so we have to move on. All right. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Next question is on homelessness. <clears throat> Family homelessness is a growing and unmanageable problem. Despite the state providing shelter to over 4,000 families each night, 50% homeless family apply for shelter are found not qualified, turn away every night. Here's the question. As state rep, how will you ensure that no child spends the night in an unsafe place or as to be separate from his or her parents to be safe? We start with candidate Michelle Dubois. Oh. Malani, okay. Okay, people speak and listen. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Thanks for the backup. Um, so, um, homelessness is obviously a huge issue in especially the gateway communities. And I think we need to start with expanding the counseling that we give to families who are on that threshold and start some early intervention and working with them to see how they can get back up on their feet. I think it's also important to expand on programs like um, Home Save is one example where you know they get vouchers and they can stay, children and families can stay with either relatives or close family friends and what have you. I think we need to expand on, on programs such as that because you know no child should be without their parents or left unsafe. Um, the fact that right now we have so many um, people held up in hotels is just, it's embarrassing to Massachusetts. We can do so much better. And like I said, early intervention is, in, is an easy way to you know, start looking at what specific concerns each family has because you know, no two families are the same in their issues. And so if we can get some early intervention and then also expand upon the programs that we also have, as I mentioned, Home Safe, um, I think it'll be a great way to keep these families together and keep them in homes where they can then start to get back on their feet. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Victor. First, we need to stop creating homelessness people, helpless people. The ever widening gap between those that have and those that don't has to stop. That and the rising cost of everything, primarily taxes. All it takes is one tragic episode, such as losing a job or getting sick, and the average American could be homeless in a matter of months. It happens every day. 
To address the problem today, we need to open more shelters, obviously. To help fund these, we need to rip apart the state budget and find the wasteful programs and projects before it becomes wasted money. We can solicit donations from big business and wealthy individuals, yes, and let them write a small portion of it off. If we close all loopholes that big business and the wealthy in general now enjoy, they will be more apt to take anything that they can get. This is just one idea as to what can be done to help homelessness. It's tragic, but like I said, it can happen to anybody. I've seen it happen to people. It's sad. Good, hardworking people in this country have become homeless every single day because the greed is getting out of control. Businesses are all about profits. I mentioned that earlier. And you become a number. And the thoughtfulness and the compassion that this country and the state and the city used to show isn't evident as much anymore unless something tragic happens. When a tragedy happens, then you see Americans come together. Let's not let this continue. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Now we turn to Peggy. Thank you. Um, in my research on homelessness, there's a direct correlation between poverty and loss of housing. The foreclosure epidemic has contributed greatly to the increase of homelessness in Massachusetts. Our homelessness has increased from 11.4% to 11.6%. We have the fifth highest increase in homelessness among all the states between 2012 and 2013. Right now we have many students in schools that are homeless that live in hotels or are bused from faraway cities. Um, to start as a state representative, we make sure that more families stay in their homes to decrease the amount of homelessness. More shelters need to be opened to account for the people that are now, but I think more work should be done with the people who have lost their homes to work out more programs so that they can keep their homes. And that's why I think the minimum wage is so important also, because at $8.50 an hour, that equals to $340 a week. $340 a week times four is only $1,300 a month, and an average apartment goes for $1,400. So there's a direct correlation between the minimum wage and homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Now we turn to Council Dubois. Thank you, Andrews. My background is, always has been in my professional career working with vulnerable populations. I did it at Pine Street Inn, I did it at St. Francis House, and I did it at New England Shelter for Homeless Veterans. And I know what the issues are. In 2012, the legislature passed a, a piece of legislation that put draconian measures and um, and on homeless people, that it exclude them from emergency shelter. As state representative, I would reform that legislation. Right now, you have to have slept with your children in a place uninhabitable for people in order to gain access to emergency shelter. That precludes you from being able to even emergency shelter until you have slept with your children in a bus terminal or in your car or, God forbid, on the street. So right there, that's something that we need to fix. Another issue that's keeping people out on the street is the fact that right now in 2012, those rules, that legislation, forced homeless people to provide documentation without, um, without really allowing a homeless person to have that sort of documentation. Housing First is the model that's going to solve homelessness in Massachusetts. I work at South Coast <coughs> County's Legal Services. We work on homelessness every single day, providing tenants legal representation from eviction, helping people to overcome foreclosure so they don't get kicked out on the street. I have a solution for this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and we should all good luck. All right, so here's the fifth and last question. Uh, education. The Chapter 70 funding scheme means that more than 400 new Brockton school children have not been accounted for this year's funding. Since numbers are based on enrollment from the previous year, 
causing a $6 million gap in the Brockton public schools alone. My question is, as a state rep, how would you work to rectify the system which is hurting our children? And the question goes to candidate Backner. Backner. Oh, Backner, all right. Thank you. <laughs> Chapter 70 Education Aid is the Commonwealth's primary program for distributing its portion of K-12 public education funding to the state's 328 local and regional school districts. The Chapter 70 formula basically is what this is about. It aims to ensure that each school district has sufficient resources to provide an adequate education for all of its students. It takes into account the ability of each local government to contribute. In short, the formula is designed to have an equalizing effect with, le with wealthy districts receiving less wealthy districts with even more state aid than wealthier ones. A city like Brockton receives about 90% of its funding in state aid. West Bridgewater gets about 20%. It's no wonder that the residents there are a little up in arms, you know, their, their property taxes are pretty high as it is. And uh, odds are going up as well in Brockton. But there, there, there's some problems with this. In 2007, the legislature enacted Chapter 70 reforms and is phasing them in slowly. And coupled with the economic crisis and budget cuts, the state, uh, the state has been decreasing aid everywhere. That's just unthinkable, particularly in this economic climate. He's telling me to wrap it up. I got a lot here, but I'm going to have to wrap it up. These cuts should not be taking place. Schools should be our number one priority, along with seniors, disabled veterans, veterans, our roads, and Thank public safety. Thank you, candidate Backnes. Uh, candidate Curtis. Thank you. Chapter 75, are extremely important to all of our cities and towns. And the way the budget is calculated is based on the number of students and the educational needs, teacher compensation, English language learners. Brockton proportionately has more of those students, so they receive more of that funding. The Chapter 70 funds are a uh, gap to uh, fill in the amount of money that the city itself puts in and to meet that limited uh, that limit of budget for each um, school. The calculation also goes back to adding 0.3% of each town's total property values to 1.4%. So that's why property values change according to the formula. Um, by filling in this gap between a district, it helps meet their needs. But in Brockton's case, we've seen an increase of 450 students for the last couple of years. I work at the Raymond School as an educator. Our school, K through 8, is 1,100 students. So 450 students is half a school. So you're increasing the budget by half a school year every single year. I would like to recalculate the budget to include an average of increase of students within the last three years to increase the budget in proportion so that we can get some of those money. Thank you, candidate Curtis. Councilor Duba. Thank you very much. I was I've been honored to receive the Mass Teachers Association endorsement in this race. And through that process, um, they determined that I had the best grasp of issues as far as education, <laughs> funding, and what we need to do to make our students achieve and be able to um, support themselves as adults in, in good, good positions. So as a, as a state legislature, late legislator, as your state representative, I would draft um, legislation that would create an emergency fund for communities like Brockton, New Bedford, that have these high fluctuations and populations of students. And then the school system could petition um, the, for the fund to get additional uh, monies if their student population uh, blew up, as it does in gateway cities and other uh, communities where there are high rates of people moving in each year. So that would be the short-term fix. Over the long term, I would look at ways um, that Brockton is not being appropriately funded and that the whole school system and the way it's being funded um, kind of ignores the problems of urban centers like Brockton. But that emergency um, fund 
would solve this problem of having uh, have to wait a whole nother year to get funding for the students that come in <coughs> one, um, one academic calendar to the next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Bar. Candidate Maloney. Um, Chapter 70 funding is a lot of the reason why I joined this race. I'm currently on Southeast Regional's school committee, and so I see how the formula affects both that as a regional vocational school, and then also in looking at surrounding towns' budgets and what they're what they're dealing with. Our taxes continue to go up, but funds like Chapter 70 and local aid in general continue to see cuts. And to me, that makes absolutely no sense because our schools should be. A, the most important issue, as well as the local aid to our communities and towns, because that pays for things like police, fire, and other public services. Um, to address the specific concerns asked in the questions, Brockton's a gateway community, which means it sees a high fluctuation of residents moving in and out. We need to start addressing, Brockton can't wait for those funds to come in. We need to start addressing them immediately, so we need to have a better understanding of, you know, when. It needs to be a continuous, orderly look at how what the actual populations of students is. We can't wait until the end of the year to say, oh, we happen to get 400 extra students, and so you'll see that funding in another seven months, because that's unacceptable. Thank you, Kenny Maloney. OK, that concludes the, uh, the question segment. Um, we are going to allow the candidates one minute closing statements, and uh, when the minute is up, our timekeeper Grant will uh, stand up. <laughs> Keeping with the rotation, we're going to begin with candidate Curtis. Thank you um, for taking the time this evening to come out and listen to our views. And I also thank uh, my hosts for um, hosting this um, important forum. This is the last forum before the election on Tuesday, this Tuesday coming up, September 9th. I believe I am the best candidate for state representative. I have the most community service. I have worked on the most, uh, the most current legislative issues, the minimum wage bill, the quarry reform, the um, earn sick time. I've also earned a citation from the Coalition of Social Justice for my work on the minimum wage bill and the earn sick time bill. I'm also the only educator and I feel that I truly understand the needs of education and <coughs> students. When elected, I would like to serve on the Joint Education Committee and the Joint Committee on Mental Health and Labor and Workforce Development. On Tuesday, September 9th, please vote your new choice, new board. Thank you, Kim. Thank Curtis. Okay, moving along. Councilor Dubois. I want to thank everyone for being here this evening. I have grown up in Brockton. I went to Brockton Public Schools. I now live here with my husband, Adam. And I've served the city of Brockton as a city councilor for the last nine years, having been reelected five times by Brockton families. And I know firsthand the beauty of Brockton. But I also don't turn a blind eye to the problems that we have. And as city councilor, I have fought for the families and the people here in Brockton to make it a better place and to make sure that people were respected and government was accountable to the residents. I've done that time and time again. As your state representative, I will prioritize increasing uh, local aid to fund education and after school programs, preschool, workforce development, roads and infrastructure improvement, and services to elders and veterans. Those issues are critical to me as I know that they're critical to all of you. I am the most experienced person in this race. And I am Thank you, Councilor Dubois. Thank you. Uh, Councilor, I'm sorry, candidate Maloney. Um, Pauline Maloney, um, thank you guys for coming out. I also want to thank the hosts as well for having us. Um, I'm one of the younger candidates in the race, which is something I get questions on a lot. But I'm also I'm on Southeast Regional's school committee. I was elected as their chairwoman, um, and I want I think it's time that we start looking at the state house has been really retroactive in the bills that they passed. One you know easy example is the tax tax bill, which they passed it and they immediately had to. to um, repeal it because it would have you know destroyed industries and so I think it's time that we start looking at where we want to be 
5, 10, 15 years down the road and set up some type of strategic plan for what Massachusetts needs and then start addressing those concerns now. Um, I, I've lived in the district my whole life. I just graduated actually from Stonehill, but before that I went to the public school <coughs> district. And again, my name is Colin Maloney, and thank you guys so much for having me. Candidate Becker. Well, there goes the rapid close. Um, <laughs> we live in an ever-changing world. Diversity of cultures abound. It's how we embrace these changes and a cultural uniqueness that will determine our future, future is thoughtful and compassionate Americans. When voting on September 9th in the Democratic primary, just ask yourself, do you wish to be saddled with more unnecessary and irresponsible taxation on property, gasoline, and all other commodities? Or do you want to vote with someone like me who will always fight against tax increases for the average American? Are you satisfied with the state distribution of our tax dollars while wasting billions? Are our unnecessary services given enough priority? If you don't think so, then vote for me, Paul Beckner, on Tuesday, September 9th. I'm the only one who's going to stand up for you every step of the way. Go to my website, peckforrep.com, and please get a copy of my uh, 11 points of priority before you leave tonight. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for the candidates.